Hey, welcome to 49cc Scoot. My name's Brent. In my last video, I fit a Yamaha Aerox front wheel on my Chinese scooter. And in that process, I discovered that I've got a bunch of play in the front end. Obviously, that's not good, so I'm going to take the front end apart and check that out. The first step for me was getting the scooter secured on the bench. That's really easy for me with T2 because this thing has welded foot pegs, so it goes up on jack stands quickly, and then I just use ratchet straps for extra security. For scooters with a center stand, it can be as simple as strapping down the rear so that the front raises, but you may want to use stands or other methods to get the front a bit higher. The most important thing is that the scooter is secure and that it won't fall off while you work. Once secured, I was ready to get to work, beginning by removing the brake caliper. I hung the caliper with a bungee cord so the brake hose didn't have to support its weight. Then I could remove the axle and the wheel. I unhooked my speed sensor and cut the cable free of the forks. The handlebars needed to come off next. There are lots of switches and gauges there, so the easiest method for me is to disconnect all of the electrical connectors that attach the handlebars to the rest of the scoop. Then I remove both brake lever and master cylinder assemblies. This is far easier than removing brake hoses and having to drain and fill later and bleed the brakes. By the way, if you have drum brakes, those are usually even simpler with just a cable to unhook or they may even be part of control assemblies that come off with a couple of screws and the cables can remain connected. These reservoirs should be okay sitting at different angles, but I prefer to secure them upright so there's very little chance that they leak. Then I remove the throttle assembly. Mine's aftermarket and standalone, but you may have to take the right side controls apart to get the throttle out on a stock scooter. Once that was done, I double checked to be sure that there was nothing left on the bars still attached to the frame. I use an aftermarket adapter and bars with two bolts to clamp onto the steering stem, but most stock stuff is very similar. Some use a clamping bolt like these, and some have a bolt that goes all the way through the stem with a nut on the other side. The handlebars lifted right off this time, but it doesn't always go that well. Sometimes these aftermarket adapters will grab on pretty well and they'll need a little bit of upward persuasion with a rubber mallet or something that won't damage them and or gently prying the clamping section apart. Now I've got two steering stem nuts to remove. These are rounded so you can't just use a regular socket or wrench. What most people do is take a screwdriver or a punch and use that to press against one of the indentations and then tap the tool with a hammer to loosen the nut. There are also spanner type tools meant for steering stem nuts, but most people don't have those around. I made this socket from a piece of steel tubing by grinding one end to match the stem nuts and welding a plate on the end with a drilled and filed square hole for a 3 8 drive. Honestly, it's pretty pointless. The hammer and punch method works just fine for this. The lower nut is not usually very tight. Once both of those are off, the dust cap can be removed. There's no seal on this bike, just a cap that keeps the majority of debris and water out, but you can see that the old grease still looks pretty clean. Now this nut can be removed. You either need a very deep socket or some type of wrench here. As this nut is backed off, it will allow the steering stem to start moving, so the steering stem has to be supported from the bottom to prevent it from falling and to make removing the nut easier. Then the stem can slide out of the frame, but be careful not to lose the bearings or anything else that may come out with it. Some of these use loose ball bearings that can roll away. I set the stem aside and then remove the upper caged bearing. I wiped out most of the grease and then used kerosene and a rag to finish cleaning the bearing race. I did the same thing for the lower race. Then I removed the lower bearing from the steering stem. I noticed that the grease in the lower section was all very gritty and dark, 
The lower bearing has no dust cap or seal on this and actually many small scooters. So it's open to the elements and it's very clear that the grease picks up lots of dirt and debris because of this, which will reduce bearing life and service intervals. I clean the stem and its bearing race and then I clean the bearings and all of the hardware. Once clean, I started inspecting everything. All of the parts related to the upper bearing, where the grease was clean, looked good. Everything related to the lower bearing, where the grease was dirty and gritty, had problems. The race on the steering stem had a groove worn into it where the bearings ride. And this race was corroded and felt rough. The BBs in the cage bearing had some pitting and minor discoloration or corrosion. The lower bits definitely needed to be replaced, and if you're going to replace that stuff, the upper part should be replaced as well. So I started removing the bearing races, beginning with the one on the stem. There's a little space under the race where I could fit a pry bar, but no reasonable amount of force would move it. Many people use a chisel driven under the race to force the race upward, but that can damage the steering stem. Others prefer to use a rotary tool like a Dremel with a small cutting disc to carefully cut a groove into the race. Because of the shape and size of most cutoff wheels, you can't usually cut all the way through without hitting the stem, so a hammer and chisel can be used to break the race where the cut was made, and then it should come right off. Because I had plenty of room below the race in some areas, and a lip that I could catch on others, I chose to heat the race with a map gas torch to cause it to expand and make it easier to remove. It didn't take much heat before I could begin to move the race by prying under it. I used a little more heat to help keep the race hot and then tapped it upward on the opposite side from where I pried. I continued working back and forth to remove the race somewhat evenly and it came off without damaging any part of the stem. I cleaned the area with kerosene after it cooled and then moved on to removing the races inside of the frame. These races have a lip that sticks out from the walls of the frame, so a hammer and a punch, or in my case a long steel rod, can be used to drive them out. Try to move around and ease them out instead of just driving them out and hammering on only one spot. That way they'll come out a bit more straight. If the races get very crooked, they could scar the inside of the frame as they're driven out. It was the same process for the upper and the lower. You can actually see that the lower came out more slanted than I would have preferred, and it brought a few metal shavings with it. The frame was okay, but you can see why it's best to keep the races as straight as possible while they're removed. I cleaned the frame with kerosene as well. Then I took measurements of pretty much everything related to the bearings. I measured the bearings themselves, the races, the steering stem, the frame, and I checked the thread size for the stem nuts. This is good practice with Chinese scooters because you can't always find parts specifically for your make and model, so the measurements give you a way to order the right parts the first time. You can also take the parts you've removed to a local scooter shop if you happen to have one around, and sometimes you can even find matching parts at bicycle shops. I took measurements for other reasons as well. When I first started the job, I was thinking about converting to tapered roller bearings, more similar to what some motorcycles use, in hope that it may be more heavy duty since this bike sees a lot of abuse from jumping the front wheel up. That didn't work out because I found that I would need 27 by 43 by up to about 9 millimeter thick bearings up front for the lower spot, and a 25 by 43 by 6 or so for the upper, and I couldn't source anything in those sizes. The upper bearing would also be very tough to fit because the stem had a 25.6 millimeter diameter, so no standard size bearing would fit it and it'd have to be machined or otherwise modified to fit, and my little lathe couldn't handle that job. Aside from machining, bearing placement would also have to be just right. That's likely easy enough on the lower section of the stem as it would probably need to bottom out against the stem, but there's nothing to indicate where a press-on bearing would need to go for the upper. I'm sure it could be done, but it would be way more effort and expense than I feel would be justified for me. I ended up picking up this Motoforce bearing and race set from ScooterTuning.ca.
It's listed for CPI, Keyway, and Vento scooters and matched up well to my 2004 Vento Triton. This set uses loose ball bearings instead of cage bearings like I had in there. The scooter actually used to use these stock, but I switched to cage bearings because they were easier to install when I was pretty new to scooters. Loose BBs are actually the better way to go because they don't have those plastic or metal cages taking up room where you could fit more ball bearings. By the way, if you need parts for your bike, check out scootertuning.ca. They are in Canada, but they get parts to me here on the east coast of the U.S. quicker and cheaper than U.S. sites that I was using. They carry some replacement parts and a whole lot of aftermarket performance parts. Big bore kits, pipes, carbs, CVT stuff, styling upgrades, and much more. They give me a discount, which helps to support this channel and keep my projects going, so please support them. Back to the task at hand, I also took measurements so I could try to find some sort of seal or dust cap for the lower bearing. I've wanted to do that from the start, but seeing how much difference there was in the wear between the clean upper and dirty lower bearings reinforced the need for a solution. I spent some time on a few parts sites hoping that I'd find something else close enough to work from another scooter and tried searching more generically for dust caps and dust seals, but I didn't have much luck. There's almost certainly something out there that would work, but so many listings offer no dimensions. I ended up buying two different shaft seals to see if I could make either one of those work but before trying those or replacing the bearings and races, I had a couple of other things to take care of while the front end was apart. The lower section of the stem was getting rusty, so I didn't want to put it back together that way. The shocks needed to come out, so I removed the caps first, remembering that there is spring pressure below them. I also took out the spacer in each fork leg. Most of these won't have spacers in stock form, but I added them to mine some time ago. Then I removed the bolts that clamp in the fork tubes. Sometimes forks will slide out pretty easily, but these did not. I used the pry bar to open the stem a little bit to remove the fork. If you just want to remove the shocks to work on the stem, the caps can go right back on along with anything else that you removed. But I had some work to do to the shocks as well, so I went ahead and removed the springs and drained the fork oil before putting the caps back on, just to keep the dust and debris out while I did other things. I used wire wheels and a little bit of sanding to remove the rust. You may notice that I taped off the area where the lower race sits to help me avoid hitting it with a grinder. Then I masked off the threads and the race area again before applying primer and paint. I went back to working on the forks while the paint was drying. I'm heavy and most scooter suspensions are a little bit soft for me. I used thicker fork oil and added spacers long ago and that helped a little bit to help the front sag less, but I wanted to see if I could stiffen the front even more with another cheap modification. Cutting coil springs to shorten them will make them more stiff. This sounds counterintuitive, but it does work. I'll put links in the description that explain it more technically and provide calculations, but basically a spring is made of wire. The thickness and the length of the wire used, and the pitch of the coils, that's the spacing between the coils, will all affect the spring stiffness along with some other factors. For now, the main things to focus on are the wire thickness and the wire length. Thicker wire and or a shorter length of wire will increase the rate or stiffness of a spring. Thinner wire and or a longer length of wire will decrease the spring rate or create a softer spring. When you cut a coil spring, you're reducing the length of the wire used to make it and that increases the spring rate. Just knowing that simply because it says so in a book or online doesn't mean that it makes much sense to me, so here's a sort of thought experiment that I've seen posted all over the place that may help. I've got 12 inch, 6 inch, and 3 inch lengths of wire here. They're all the same 18 gauge wire and we'll just have to call them roughly straight because the wire comes in a spool and it's tough to make them totally straight. Close enough. I put one end of the 12 inch wire against my vise and push on the opposite end. It's very easy to bend or deform the wire. If I do the same thing with a 6 inch wire, it becomes more difficult. And by the time I get to the 3 inch wire, it takes much more effort to bend or deform. According to many, this may not be how we should think about it because they say a spring acts as, or at least similar to, a torsion bar and it's a twisting force that we should be thinking about rather than just compression force. 
Okay, that's easy enough to do a quick experiment with as well using the same 12, 6, and 3 inch wires. This time I've put a 90 degree bend on each end of every wire. Instead of trying to press the two ends toward each other, I'm going to grab the bent ends and try to twist them in opposite directions. Starting with a 12 inch wire, I can twist these about 90 degrees apart without applying too much force, basically just twisting until the wires are uncomfortable against my fingers. If I switch to the 6 inch wire, I get about 45 degrees of twist with roughly the same effort and discomfort. Finally, the 3 inch wire only twists maybe 20 to 25 degrees with similar effort. Obviously this is not a very scientific or accurate demonstration, but maybe it does give us at least some partial understanding of why cutting springs would stiffen them. Again, check the description of this video for a more in-depth and technically accurate explanation. I should also mention that many will tell you that replacing the fork springs with springs having the desired properties would be the best way to modify the front suspension. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I would say that finding pre-made springs to fit both my needs and my small Chinese scooter is not so simple. I'm sure I could have something made, but that could be expensive and cutting these is not. I'm also willing to take the risk if I don't like the end result and have to replace the springs or even if I have to replace the entire shocks. I measured the spring lengths and they came out to about eight and a quarter inches or 210 millimeters. There are calculations to determine spring rate, so you could do the math with the original springs and decide how much change that you want based on that or possibly even target a specific spring rate. I went with the much less scientific approach of deciding to cut about 20 millimeters off or a little over three quarters of an inch and we'll just see what happens. My springs happen to be progressive rate springs, which means they have more than one spring rate. You can see that the springs are more tightly wound with smaller gaps between the coils on one end. This changes the spring pitch and spring pitch changes the spring rate. The longer the pitch or the farther apart the coils are spaced, the higher the spring rate will be and vice versa. So this end of the spring with the coils close together is softer than the other end with the coils farther apart. This creates the problem of deciding which end to cut. If you have a linear rate spring where the coils are all evenly spaced, it doesn't really matter which end you cut as long as there are no special mounting concerns on one end or the other. I tried to do a little research before doing any cutting, but there seemed to be disagreement among sources as far as which end should be cut on progressive rate springs. A trusted friend recommended cutting the end with more narrow pitch, and that made sense to me when thinking about wire length. If I cut 20 millimeters off of the more tightly wound section, it would remove more wire length than taking 20 millimeters off of the end with a wider pitch. It would also make sense to me to remove some of the softer section since I'm trying to stiffen the spring overall. To be honest, I can reason this out in my head all sorts of ways to make arguments for cutting either end, but I went with cutting the end with the more narrow pitch. I marked each spring 20 millimeters from the end and then put them in a vise with only the last two to three inches sticking out. Too much unsupported spring will make the spring move around a lot when you try to cut it. I used a cutoff wheel to chop down the springs and tried to cut right on the 20 millimeter line, flattening out a section of the spring as I cut. I was initially thinking that maybe cutting the spring as straight across as I could and flattening the spring by cutting would let the spring sit pretty straight and then I'd only have to deburr and smooth the cut. But that wasn't the case. I wanted to be sure the springs would sit up straight so the ends were nice and flat and have a good seating area. So I decided to bend a little bit of the end of each spring to create a nice solid flat seat. I used a map gas and oxygen torch that I could adjust to a fine point to target only a specific area and heated just the ends to red hot. I first tried to bend the end with pliers, but I found that it was easier just to press the end of the spring against my vise and flatten it that way. Of course, make sure you wear protective gear if you do this stuff. That gave me a mostly flat end, and with a little grinding, the springs would sit straight up on their own, just as they would in stock form. I do want to mention here that some say heating the end as much as I did is a bad thing. Too much heat will alter the properties of spring steel wire, and can soften it or even make it brittle. This is why I made sure to target only a small area at the end that would become the seating area. But some say even that's not good enough, and suggest using a propane torch or mild heat and hammering or otherwise bending the end using more force instead of relying much more on heat as I did. I did wear gloves as shown earlier, 
but most of the spring didn't even feel hot right after heating the end, so my hope is that not enough heat transferred away from the end to affect the rest of the spring. I laid both springs beside each other to make sure they were the same length. If you cut more off of one spring than the other, it could cause potentially dangerous handling issues, so try your best to keep both springs even. If you're cutting the spring, you will need spacers to make up for the amount of spring that you remove. The exception would be if you're cutting springs as part of lowering the front end. In my case, I cut 20 millimeters off of the springs, so I needed 20 millimeter spacers, which I made out of 6061 aluminum on the lathe. A lot of people just use PVC pipe with washers placed on each end during assembly for simple spacers. Once those were done, I wanted to put the shocks back together, but I had a little bit of rust on the fork tubes, so I used metal polish and steel wool to get rid of that. Then, one shock at a time, I took the cap off and set the shock upright in the vise so I could refill them with 20 weight fork oil and set the fork oil height to 85 millimeters just as they were before taking them apart. I'm not going into much detail here because I have an entire video about fork service, so check that out in the description if you need more info. Once the height was set, the springs went back in along with both spacers. I put the springs back in with a tightly wound end facing up just as they came out but it doesn't really matter as long as you put them in the same way in both forks. At that point the shocks were finished, so I went back to working on the steering maintenance, installing the races in the frame. Races can be driven or pressed in, but most prefer pressing. You can buy tools just for this job, but making something that should work isn't too complicated. A long piece of threaded rod and some nuts and washers that match up to it will be needed. I had a piece of 3 8 all thread that was 16 inches long on hand. 5 16 or 8 mm rod may work, but I'd prefer 3 8 or 10 mm as about the minimum. If you can find a socket that is just a little smaller than the OD of the race, that can work to push in the race. It should contact the race on the outer lip and not on the bearing surface. I had a seal driver attachment that I made in the past that happened to match up well, and it's aluminum, so much less likely to damage the race or the frame. I made up a small bushing to change the size of the hole in the center to 3 8 for a much better fit with a threaded rod. There also needs to be a cap of some sort on the opposite end of the steering head, and I used a seal driver attachment from a kit that is also aluminum for that. I installed the upper race first, but the order really doesn't matter. I started by applying a light coating of grease to the area where the race will sit before trying to get the race started into the frame by hand. The race doesn't go far in with just hand pressure but they will usually stay in place while you set up the pressing tool. Then I used two nuts locked together and then a washer and then the cap on one end of the rod and slid that up through the bottom of the frame. I put my adapter in place along with a washer and nut and began to spin the nut down. Once the nut was lightly snugged, I worked on trying to get the adapter centered on the race and keeping the rod straight before tightening the nut enough to lock everything in place better. Then I held the lower nut with a wrench while tightening the top nut to pull the race into the frame. You can see that the race was going in a little bit canted. It looks like I actually started it that way when I was just setting it up. Just like driving them out, ideally we want races to go in straight so they will go in easier and with less risk of anything being damaged. Apparently I didn't press record, but I backed the pressing tool off and then used the adapter to tap the edges that were sitting the highest in a little bit to straighten the race out better before setting the tool back up. It still wasn't totally straight, but you can see that it easily seated itself properly when I finished pulling it in. Once the pressing or pulling tool was removed, I verified that the race was sitting all the way up against the lip in the steering head all the way around with even gaps between the race and the top of the frame. It's the same process to install the lower race, just with a puller put in the opposite way. The lower race tried to go in a little bit crooked as well, but not too bad. I think I could improve this setup by making my own cap with a lip that matches the frame and having the center bore closer to the size of the threaded rod, so that way everything would be much more likely to stay straight but it worked. Normally I would install the race on the steering stem next, but I wanted to figure out if I could make some sort of seal work to block at least some of the dust and debris to keep the lower bearing area cleaner. 
Neither of the seals that I ordered would fit right out of the box. The 25 by 52 by 8 seal would sit where the race needs to be and force the race to sit further upward. I also had a 37 by 52 by 8 seal. It fit around the boss on the stem just below where the race sits, but the center shaft ceiling area was too tall and would also potentially limit where the race could sit. I used a box cutter and trimmed off most of the center ceiling area, so basically I had a rubber coated cup instead of a seal. That fit pretty well, sitting just a little bit taller than the stop for the bearing race. Being rubber and rubber coated, I thought that it should work fine and allow the race to put enough pressure on it once installed to keep it in place and help it seal without changing where the race sits. Next up, I greased the area where the seal and race would sit and put the seal back on. I found a piece of aluminum tubing in the garage that matched up well to the race, just as I described earlier. Some people use steel pipe, but again I like to use something softer than the race if possible. I did use a block of wood when hitting the aluminum tube so the hammer wouldn't damage it. You could try to press or drive the race on using only force, but I heated the race a little with a map gas torch to make it easier. That worked out very well, and the race was most of the way in place with just a little pressure, and a few taps seated it all the way down. The race did as I had hoped and held the seal in place with a little pressure. I did a quick test fitting, pushing the seal against the frame, and it looked like it should work so I could move on to installing the bearings and the steering stem. I counted out all of the BBs that came with the kit and divided them evenly. The kit came with 46 ball bearings, or 23 per side. That doesn't necessarily mean that every ball bearing should be used though. Usually they provide spares. If you have a service manual, it may tell you exactly how many BBs should be used top and bottom. And by the way, some bikes will use a different amount for the top and the bottom, usually if they have different race sizes. If you don't have a spec, you can come up with something close enough to work in most cases. I used the cap race just because it was the easiest to work with, and I inserted BBs to see how they fit. 23 would fit, but they seem to be pretty tightly packed in there. If too many bearings are used, one or more can be displaced and cause problems with installation or operation. 22 seemed like a better fit to me to leave a little bit of wiggle room. I later found that there is actually a spec for the Triton which is 21 per side, but 22 would also work. Just for comparison, the old cage bearings only had 16 balls each, so there's definitely more contact area with these loose BBs. I applied a generous amount of grease to the lower race on the stem with a bit overflowing into the ceiling area. If there's a little too much grease, it will get pushed out and it may make a little mess somewhere, but I'd rather use too much than not enough. Then I inserted the ball bearings one by one. This is definitely not my idea of a good time, but as long as you've got enough grease in there, they should stay put once you get them in place. I put plenty of grease on the lower race that's inside of the frame as well, and smeared a thin coating around the outside because the seal that I've added will be making contact there. The upper race was liberally coated in grease before ball bearings were installed there. Finally, the steering nut that also functions as a bearing race was coated in grease. I pushed the steering stem up through the frame, trying to be careful not to displace any of the ball bearings. Then I held pressure upward on the stem while I started threading on the top nut that acts as the top race. Watch closely as the nut begins to make contact with the bearings to be sure that everything stays in place. Now the nut can be tightened. You may find torque specs for some models and different assembly configurations, but what I do with these is tighten the nut beyond where I want it to end up. The stem should move pretty freely and the nut is usually not very tight, but I tighten until there's considerable resistance to steering and the nut is snug at first. I move the steering back and forth multiple times and re-snug the nut if it loosens. This helps to make sure everything is seated properly. Once I'm sure everything is where it should be, I loosen the nut to get the proper feel. 
Again, you may find that some manuals will give you a spec like loosen an eighth to a quarter of a turn after torquing. Without specs, I loosen the nut enough that the steering moves with little effort while also making sure that there is no up and down play. If you can push upward on the steering stem and see any movement while watching the top nut and bearings, it's too loose. Tighten the nut a bit and retry. This can take multiple attempts, but spend whatever time you need to be sure you have it right. In my case, the new seal at the bottom added a small amount of resistance when turning, so I went through this many times before I was satisfied and moved on. The dust cap went on next. Then the first of the steering stem nuts. As usual, check the service manual for exact procedure and specs here. Absent of those, I tighten the first nut as much as I can without making the steering stem tighten up. If the steering is tight, the scooter will be hard to ride and you may crash. It's very important that it continues to move freely, so again, take your time here. I'm using the socket that I made, but just like removal, you can use a screwdriver or a punch to help you tighten the nuts. Once I had the first nut set, I installed the second. This one acts as a locking nut to help keep everything in place since the fasteners below it can't be installed too tightly without affecting the steering. I used a hammer and punch to help me tighten the upper nut. The impact will let you get the top nut tight without moving the lower nut, which is pretty difficult to do when using steady pressure with something like a socket. As long as the steering still feels the same, the stem and bearings are done and now everything else needs to go back together. I started with the handlebars. These have a little bar inside that needs to match up with a notch in the top of the stem when installed, so sometimes it takes a little rotating to get these to align and push all the way down. I went to start the clamping bolts and one didn't want to start. I took the bars back off and went through the threads in the adapter with an M7 by 1.0 tap before reinstalling them. That did the trick and I was able to get both bolts started and tightened without issue. There are lots of connections to make to finish up the bars, but I like to get all the major mechanical bits on first, so I switched over to installing the forks. After removing the cap from the proper fork, remembering that left and right are usually different, I tried to push the first fork into the stem, but that wasn't happening because it was too tight. I ended up prying the stem apart a little with a large screwdriver so I could push the fork tube all the way in until it rested against the stop in the stem. The clamping bolt was installed and tightened next. As always, check your service manual to see if they provide a torque spec. If not, get it tight. Now the fun part, trying to install the cap on the fork. The cap has to be pushed down, fighting the force of the spring, while turning it clockwise to try to start the threads. Once it's in a few threads, it's just a matter of tightening it up. Then, the process is repeated for the other side. On this side of my scooter, it's a little tougher to get to the fork cap because of things in the way, so I used a long extension to make it easier to apply downward pressure to get the thread started. The wheel went on next, being sure to put the spacers on the correct side and using medium strength thread locker on the axle. Then the brake caliper was reinstalled, being sure that any spacers or washers were put back exactly how they were and using thread locker on those bolts. After that was installed, I checked again to make sure there was no play in the front end and moved the steering side to side. I was initially concerned that the seal that I added would cause too much resistance, but it wasn't even noticeable once all the weight of the suspension and the wheel were on. I was left with odds and ends to tie up at this point. I reconnected the speed sensor. Then I reinstalled the brake hose holder that I removed when painting. And then it was just a bunch of electrical connections, bolting the brake levers back on, and reinstalling the throttle. I unstrapped the scoot and got it down from the bench so I could see how it felt with both tires on the ground. 
the steering still felt easy and smooth as it should be. I couldn't tell much difference in the front suspension, but it seemed a little stiffer than before. Then I took a short ride to make sure everything was working well. Anytime you service the front steering, I would suggest taking it very slow when you first start moving. You may even want to walk beside the bike and push it a few feet to see how it steers when moving. Tight steering is not a good feeling and it's dangerous, so find out how it feels at low speed first. All was well as far as I could tell. No play in the steering, but very little resistance to turning. No instability, no weird noises, and no surprises. Pretty much all you can ask for with a successful steering service. As far as the spring modification goes, the difference is minimal. I don't think the front sags quite as much with my weight on the bike now. It may be a little stiffer going over abrupt bumps, and I think the front isn't diving quite as much under braking. It doesn't seem like cutting the springs did a whole lot for me, but it's less bouncy than it was, and that's a good thing. So overall, I'd say this was a success. I've got all new steering bearings and races with no play, fresh grease, top and bottom, with both top and bottom caps and seals now, mildly improved suspension, and I spent maybe $30 to $40 on the whole job. I'll take it. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe to see what I work on next. Thanks for watching.